Our next speaker is Jonathan Arnold, the research lead of clean growth at the Canadian Climate Institute. And Jonathan is a frequent author on the clean growth and sustainable finance. Uh, he has a diverse background in environmental policy, previous roles with Canada's Ecofiscal Commission, and an, as an economist with Environment Canada. Uh, Jonathan will outline the economic case for action, uh, including uh, the thesis that the economic risk that we now face is missing the economic opportunities by moving too slowly. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good afternoon. I'd like to uh, pick up where, where Simon left off, uh, talking about the opportunities that are present both in Metro Vancouver and, and British Columbia in, uh, in, in the context of climate change. But before I do that, I think it's helpful to understand the global context and the, the risks and opportunities there and the, the major drivers of what's happening. So in, in the research that we've done in the past few years, we've been focusing a lot on, on these, these global drivers of change. And really, it comes down to three big buckets of things, and that's policy, technology, and markets. And all of these things are happening in a way that are accelerating uh, change and creating a, a positive feedback loop. So you have policy in, in terms of countries that have now uh, committed to net zero representing. So 70 countries around the world representing 90% of global GDP, 80% uh, of global oil demand, and 70% of, of natural gas demand. So that's very significant. So even if those countries do not achieve net zero by mid-century, that driver alone will, uh, will be very significant in terms of changing the, the nature of the global economy. You have technology change. Uh, so technologies like uh, wind and solar, uh, electrolyzers, batteries and storage, all of that is getting cheaper seemingly by the day. Uh, and better as well. So these technologies won't just be um, cheaper, but they will also hopefully lead to uh, just a, a better consumer experience, which will help people uh, adopt them faster. And lastly, you have markets that are responding to all these changes. And, and, and uh, you have changes in financial markets. You have uh, investors globally representing a large swath of, uh, of, the, of the financial market um, in terms of the, the assets that they manage. And really, that is what is going to drive uh, the, the investment in these new technologies and in, in these areas that, that are absolutely necessary to achieve, uh, to, to achieve our targets. So in some of the research that we've done, um, in, in 2021, we, in, a, in a report called Sink or Swim, we wanted to stress test the Canadian economy in different global low-carbon scenarios to see how Canadian publicly traded companies would fare in, uh, in, in a world of 1.5 degrees of warming or two degrees or less of warming. And what we found is that the Canadian economy is disproportionately exposed on the risk side of the equation to the, to the transition. So this figure shows the percentage of change in, in, in market capitalization. So you can kind of think of that as, as profitability. Uh, so the change in profitability of Canadian publicly traded companies relative to other companies on international indices. So here you have the S&P uh, TSX 60, 60. So that represents the 60 biggest publicly traded companies in Canada relative to some of the other major indices. And, and by far and away, the, the Canadian uh, indice, uh, in index is uh, far more impacted uh, than, uh, than others because we are a more emissions intensive economy. So this, this poses significant risks to, uh, to the Canadian, Canadian economy, but as well, the flip side of any risk is, is an opportunity, which I'll get into in a, in a second. Uh, another way that we were, we were looking at risks and opportunities is, is looking at the change of profitability within sectors. Uh, and, and here the results get, get quite interesting. So on, on this graph, again, on the, on the y-axis, you, you have the change in profitability in these different global low-carbon scenarios of publicly traded companies. And so the bottom node represents kind of the the worst impacted companies, and then the, the uh, top node uh, reflects the, the top 10% uh, or the top 10% uh, of performers in, in these various different sectors. So there's three, three buckets that we, that we see when we look at, at the different sectors in, in the Canadian economy. Uh, the one on the left is, is not surprising. This is where there's a clear opportunity. So this is where there's going to be a ton of new demand growth for things like biofuels, uh, wind and solar, batteries and storage, and there it's about scaling up these sectors and these companies as quickly as possible uh, because we need more of them to, to achieve our targets. 
The middle category is, is I think, probably the most interesting one because it's, it's a potential opportunity depending on what the company is doing in response to climate change. So here you have things, emissions intensive sectors like iron and steel, cement, um, and, and here it really depends on what the company is doing. So on the bottom end, uh, companies could see bankruptcy uh, through, through transition if they don't change. Uh, companies that do start reducing their emissions, so a steel producer uh, that installs an electric arc furnace would be on the top end of, uh, of this graphic uh, and, and be able to turn that risk into an opportunity. And the category on the right-hand side is, is probably um, not, not surprising either. So this is where there's limited opportunity. So you have sectors like oil and gas, as well as traditional manufacturers of internal combustion engines, that if they don't start transforming into new business lines, then they see uh, significant risk and, and profitability loss in, in transition. So for automotive manufacturers, you know, obviously transitioning to, into EVs or, or hydrogen-based vehicles, uh, is a solution. Oil and gas, it's about trans, uh, transforming into new business lines so that it's less about an oil and gas company, it's more about uh, creating an energy company uh, that gets into low carbon alternatives. So that analysis that I just walked through, and I, I, I know I walked through it uh, probably too quickly, but it was backward looking in a sense that it was taking publicly traded companies as, of they, as, the, as they were in 2021. And of course, publicly traded companies are not a very good or, or representative sample of the Canadian economy. So we wanted to augment that by looking at what's happening at a much smaller scale in the Canadian economy. Uh, companies that are not publicly traded, uh, companies that are what we call pure play companies. They only do low carbon transport. They only do uh, agricultural technologies. And, and here, when we, when we look at data from, from PitchBook, we see that BC stands out in terms of the growth in the, the number of these, what we call transition opportunity companies. And we've highlighted 10 different markets or sectors where we're seeing this growth and, and this graph, I'm happy to share these slides afterwards, but it shows things like building technologies, low carbon transportation, low carbon electricity. Uh, so these are companies that are specifically in these areas that are growing significantly in, in the province. Another way, uh, another metric of measuring um, the, the extent of this opportunity and, and, and the, the degree to which there are companies that have a foothold in these markets in BC is to look at how much money they are raising uh, in, in terms of the, the businesses that, they, that they're operating. And here again, BC stands out along with Quebec uh, in terms of the, the amount of capital that these, that these companies on average are raising. And so this figure just normalizes it to GDP. So if you kind of take GDP out of the equation um, and, and creates a, a way to, to look at this in terms of apples to apples, BC and, and Quebec stand out well above the other uh, provinces in terms of uh, how much money these companies are, are uh, raising. Another way of looking at it, and this is another really important metric, is how fast these companies are scaling. Um, this, this becomes a very important uh, metric when we're, when we're looking at the... Uh, you know, a company going from uh, early research and development to full-scale commercialization. And here again, you see a number of, of success stories in British Columbia, uh, where you have fast-scaling companies like Ballard, uh, like General Fusion. And again, what's really unique about the BC context is that you have companies in all 10 of these different markets that have a foothold. Uh, I, I think it, it's Quebec and BC really that only have that kind of diversity. Most of the other provinces, especially if you look at uh, a province like Manitoba, uh, they just have the one company in, in ag tech. And um, these, are, these are the only five provinces that kind of have these, these, uh, these fast scaling companies. And lastly uh, is, is the fact that when we look at all of the uh, transition opportunity companies in the province of British Columbia, almost all of them are in Metro Vancouver. So this poses questions and, and challenges for bringing opportunities to other parts of the province, but it also shows the advantage that this region has uh, in, in the, the, again, the diversity of companies as well as how fast these companies are scaling. And uh, this, this figure just shows uh, the, the, t the top 20, I believe, uh, companies that are, that are based here in, in the province. So I'll just finish by bringing this back to policy, because this will become very important in terms of capturing the opportunities as well as reducing the risks that are, uh, that are present in transition. So the first is the, the notion of building investor confidence and investment attractiveness through ambitious and clear climate policy. So about 10, 20 years ago, 
Going hard on climate policy was seen as an economic disadvantage, a competitive disadvantage. Now, not going fast enough is the competitive disadvantage, especially when you look at what's happening south of the border in terms of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and, and the transformational change that that will play in terms of our trade relationship. Um, it, it really is about going faster and harder. Uh, there's also a, a very important component here of connecting these small transition opportunity companies with the large emissions intensive uh, areas of the economy or sectors of the economy. And here we're seeing some really good examples in BC. Uh, you have uh, Savante, which is a CCUS company partnering with Lafarge. You have Corvus Energy partnering with BC Ferries to provide hybrid electric um, vessels. So you're starting to see some examples of that, but it really comes down to driving more domestic demand for these goods and services in the BC economy. A lot of these companies are having to just scale elsewhere, and Jeanette, I think we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but really it's about driving more domestic demand here in the province where we have a lot of uh, control um, and, and levers to pull. And, and lastly, I just a more general point of if Metro Vancouver is to become and, and stay a leader in this area, Climate policy is, is really uh, all policy uh, now, and, and it's about creating the conditions um, to attract companies and, and employees and workers <clears throat> to, the, to the region, and that really does come back to affordability uh, and, and livability and, and, uh, and well-being in, in the province. And so there, there are uh, important policy uh, implications there as well. But I will leave it there, and happy to take questions uh, in a few minutes. Thanks.